thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, dear friends and colleagues, for coming here. I'm not going to sell you nuclear power, I'm, but I try to describe what, how I see the current situation in the use of nuclear energy, what may happen tomorrow, and which, what is the impact to this region. And you see here three ter terms, safety, security, and safeguards. So maybe I tell first what these terms mean, particularly I think the word safeguards may be somewhat unknown to the people. And in the IAEA, sometimes we call this uh, triple S, as the ambassador said, or they are actually unseparated triple S, because safety and security, there is a certain connection. When you secure nuclear material, then you also add some additional safety functions to that. And when you have a secured nuclear material, then it's a very difficult to, for someone to take it and misuse it, for example, for nuclear weapons, just to simplify it. So what is nuclear safety? So this is the safe use of nuclear energy, which means the safety of power plants, design set them set such a way that they operate in a safe manner, that they don't release the radioactivity in the environment, the general population doesn't get additional radiation dose from use of these uh, reactors, there will be no accidents, and when you operate these reactors, they always produce some nuclear waste, at the very end you have spent fuel, you need to do something and you have to dispose it in a safe manner, or like in Japan, they take plutonium out of it and try to use it as a fuel in nuclear power. So this is what is nuclear safety. But you have also nuclear safety issues here in Singapore. Because nuclear energy is used also for many, many other purposes and just to produce energy. Hospitals use it for radiation therapy. Some radioisotopes are used for diagnostic purposes. So the safety is also there, and there's a safety for the patients, safety for nurses and doctors, and safety also at the very end for the disposal of those radioactive materials which can be used. And some of them are very powerful, like if you give, give radiation treatment for cancer. So those radiation sources are very, very powerful. They can s kill a cell in the body, but they can kill also a person. So someone has to take care of them at the end. So this is part of the nuclear safety. And then security. Security is a little bit different thing. And um, security concerns actually came to this nuclear domain. It was there from the very beginning. I remember when I started my career in the 1970s, people talk about the security, but this was mainly to block unauthorized access to some nuclear installations and things like that, more or less locking doors uh, and making sure that materials stay there. But then at the time of the so uh, collapse of Soviet Union in early 1990s, people got much more worried about nuclear security because former Soviet Union used radioactive materials for all kinds of things you can imagine. They used, I give just an example, in a smoke detectors in uh, uh, public places. So they have used tiny small plutonium sources there. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, they never really kept any very good record of those. So and there were 80,000 such sources floating around in these new republics, and nobody really knew where they were. So the IAEA created that time then a project to help the new governments to locate the sources, take them in a custody and dispose in a safe manner so that they are not misused, for example, by terrorists and this sort of things. And then certainly more after that uh, came, you know, some concerns on ter that terrorist organization may also get, get hold on nuclear materials and even nuclear weapons. And as you should probably have seen, read very often from straight times. I have at least read that there are some concerns regarding whether the nuclear weapons in uh, Pakistan are held in a, under proper control. So that's the security aspect of nuclear energy. And then it's, it's safeguards, which is to do with the nuclear non-proliferation. Safeguards is a system to monitor 
and to make sure that these nuclear materials, which can be used to produce energy in the power reactors, are not used to be built nuclear weapons. And then there are certain agreements and treaties, which I tell a little bit later. So these are the three words. And then, as Ambassador mentioned, you know, I was working in International Atomic Energy Agency for close to 30 years. So the International Atomic Energy Agency is not, very often you might hear in news media, a nuclear watchdog, someone who controls, but it's not really the role of the IAEA. The IAEA uh, role is to men help its member states uh, with various means to make sure that nuclear energy is used in a safe manner and only for peaceful purposes. And that's the role of the IAEA. So it's more like an advisory body. It's not a promoter of nuclear energy. It's not in the statutes. And then we now got to the IAEA. So it belongs to the United Nations family. It's one of the UN specialized organizations. Yeah, its headquarters is in Vienna. It's been there always. It was established way back in 1957, uh, at the time of Cold War, when, as a result of the uh, actually very specific speech of President Eisenhower in 1953, when he made a speech which was called Atoms for Peace speech, where they saw both in Soviet Union and in, in the United States of America that while they had behind the experiences from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that there are also positive aspects in the nuclear energy, and they wanted to share this technology with the international community and the member states of the United Nations system. And that's why this specialized organization was established and came in force in 1957. So it's soon 60 years old, actually after two years in September. Offices in Vienna. It has a couple of laboratories, a very exotic place in Monaco, where there is a uh, laboratory for ocean studies and to see radioactivity in ocean and also study the history of oceans and things like that. Then it has a couple of laboratories also in Vienna. It has an office in uh, Tokyo, which is a regional office, and then another one in North Canada in Canada for North America. It belongs to the United Nations system, but it's an independent organization. It has its own governing body, board of governors, where actually Singapore, I think, might be just now a member of that board. It's a relational basis. It has 165 member states today, when the United Nations has close to 200. So it's it's quite a lot of members, members, but not all the states are members. Those which are not members are basically countries which don't have so much interest in nuclear energy, like some Pacific Islands. I saw the last two which actually joined the IAEA as a member state in September was Antigua and Barbados. So you can see which size of countries might be missing from that. It has a secretary, which is basically located in uh, Vienna. It's 2,560 people. It's quite a lot for the UN organization. And then give you an idea about its uh, operations further. It has a budget of about 460 million US dollars per year. And it covers everything, safety, security, and safety. So this as a frame. Yeah? And then, let's go then, what is the role of IAEA here? And I, I take a kind of very, very basic principles only. We can say that actually it's a cornerstone of the, I would say, world nuclear order in certain way, even though it's not a regulatory body, but it maintains a lot of documents. It's in charge of certain conventions which regulate uh, safe use of nuclear energy. In that nuclear safety area, there is a nuclear safety convention, which is not a law, but when the countries like Singapore join, 
it obligates them to follow the IEA safety rules and principles. That kind of convention, it doesn't have a system in place that anyone comes, to, for example, to Singapore to check that whether you comply with it that or not. But there is a peer review system in these days which makes sure that Singapore, for example, can invite uh, a group of experts from the IAEA to come here and to review your nuclear safety arrangements. Such kind of report can be done partly, and you can distribute it to your neighboring, neighboring countries. But it's not mandatory to make it public because this is all voluntary. And then this ha uh, safety convention has certain basic principles what you should apply when you build a nuclear installation or you use medical isotopes, what are the basic principles. And then under that is a set of documents which are called code of conduct, which go much more in detail how you deal with the radio isotopes, etc. All members of the IAEA are not party to this safety conditions. And I think that this is something which is important as Ambassador said that there are few countries which are looking, for example, to use, to use uh, nuclear power. They should all be party to the safety convention because this would make sure that they establish adequate uh, infrastructures to, to, do, to deal with this. And when I looked at, for example, uh, you know, Vietnam certainly has been always uh, or has signed to these conventions and have rati ratified them, but for example, I think Malaysia and Thailand are not. And I think that this is important if they now plan to go for nuclear power that they sign and ratify those documents at a very early day. I think Indonesia had it. So then, when we look nuclear security, there are similar kind of documents. So one of them is the physical protection Congress. And again, it's pretty much the same. Safe countries have actually signed practically the both of these conventions to make sure that the nuclear energy was also used for secure purposes. And therefore, we have the same couple of countries in this region which have not done it. And then, let's look now a little bit to the future, how we see the nuclear power developed. Today there, or end of last year, there were 438 nuclear reactors which were in such kind of states that they were, they could be operated. They were not operated, all of them, because there are quite a few reactors in Japan that are shut down. And uh, most of them were actually in the United States of America, about 100. Russia, some 30, 40. India, I think about 25. Uh, China, I think around 15. And then Japan had those 55, but you can write the Fukushima away, so they have 45 left. So these are the major countries for nuclear power. Then there are a lot of uh, smaller countries, like my home country, Finland, which has five reactors. Belgium, four, five, and this sort of thing. So that's how you come to 438. But if we look to the future, like year 2030, entirely different, entirely different things, because the focus will move to this year. Now there are about 60 nuclear reactors <coughs> under construction today. More than half of them are in Asia. Most of them in China, but also South Korea has some, and India will have a lot. So we will see this kind of shift, and this kind of brings the nuclear energy much closer to you. Uh, the biggest nuclear power country year 2030 will be China, with 130 nuclear power plants uh, projected at, at this point of time. So think about in 15 years, they are going to build about 100 nuclear power reactors. This history has never seen such kind of 
uh, development. In the U.S., they did quite a lot of them in 1960s and early 70s, but this is going to be a tremendous challenge. It's going to be a tremendous challenge to China because you need to have competent people, competent people to design those reactors, competent people to construct them, competent people to run them, competent people to have the regulatory bodies, and then you need all the supporting infrastructure, scientific infrastructure, technical infrastructure to support those. And the question is then, do they have the resources? And this is going to be a tremendous challenge for the Chinese nuclear establishment to have all those skills. Then the other important change in the picture is that there will be quite a lot of newcomer countries. So today those nuclear power plants, 438, it's a little bit more than 30 countries. But there will be about one dozen, 15 countries which will build nuclear power for the first time. And here is again a change. It's not going to be in Europe. It's not going to be in Latin America. It's going to be pretty much in Asia and the Middle East. Jordan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, for sure, possibly Malaysia and Indonesia. So they discounted already most of those 13 countries. And then a couple of countries in Africa, most likely Algeria, Nigeria, and then a few in Latin America. So this is a huge change on this picture. And there is one more big change to come. And this is to do with the original technology. Until now, most of the uh, power reactors more or less are tied with some American technology or French technology or Russian technology. This is also going to change. Russia will remain as an important uh, reactor constructor and seller. China will be a new entity in this they start exporting on nuclear power plants on top of those what they are going to build in next 15 years. And then South Korea, which has already succeeded to sell the reactor to United Arab Emirates. Then the fourth thing which will be different here, if I compare to the previous way of uh, constructing nuclear power plants, is that particularly the Russians are looking for a concept of build, own, and operate. So actually they are giving a package to these countries which has all power plants, they operate them, and, and then uh, uh, they own them. And then what is left to the country is just to make sure that the Russian entities work properly and have a safe operation. So the regulatory body of these countries will have a tremendous job. And a good example of that is Bangladesh, which has selected that option. And this raises then the question, do these countries, the newcomer countries, some of them are not overly rich, but how they can get the infrastructure in place which make sure that these are operated with a competent constructed properly, operated with competent people, there is adequate regulatory arrangements, and the responsibilities are clearly defined. And this, I think, is one of those most important things which stay ahead. And then, who will be in charge of all this? Actually, it will be the states. The state which acquires this nuclear power. They are, according to the this uh, conventions in charge of those nuclear installations to make sure that they are built properly, operated properly, running properly, and any waste which is generated will be taken care of. And this means that there is a tremendous training exercise ahead to make sure that the infrastructure is in place, legislation is based. IAEA does it, but it cannot do much of it because of the resources. And I give you, just as, as an example, about the magnitude of people involved. So in 2013, 
uh, World Institute of Nuclear Security, which is also located in Vienna, made a study and found out that uh, today, when you look nuclear security only, there are 230,000 people involved with nuclear security global, globally. And if you are working in the industry, and many of you will be, because we're in technical university, a generation in a working place is one generation is about 10 years. So I would say and argue that every 10 years, you need to re-educate these 23,000 people, and you need to have a replacement for another 23,000, just to have a balance. But now, on top of that, we have this tremendous shift on the needs, which means that you need to do this additional thing, particularly to educate the people in China, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Pakistan. They don't want to hear it, but I think this is a fact. And to that end, IAEA has set up its own system, but the whole system will depend very heavily on individual states, and the regional cooperation. There is a thing which is called Global Nuclear Safety and Security Network. It's the IAEA main base, which has about 120, 130 member states are part of it. Singapore is there, I understand, have understood. And then they have created this, what is called a center of excellence, excellencies for the education. There's one in Indonesia, there's one in Malaysia, I think there's South Korea, Japan, China at least. And they are educating their own people and uh, also people from the neighboring countries. And uh, these Asian centers, they gave training last year for, I think, for three, 4,000 people. So there's a lot of things going on. But if you compare it to the numbers, which I may mention, there's a tremendous challenge still ahead because these numbers need to grow radically. And then the other thing is that this system has been established very recently. Actually, this centers of excellence came at, as a result that it was 2012 nuclear security summit, or was it 2010? So it's a five-year-old system. And they give a lot of training, seminars, manuals, and all this. And the outcome at this point of time, I think, is still measured in terms of numbers, so and so many people trained. But I think it's also important to find out what is the impact. Is this the right the training? Are people absorbing it? Do they get transferred to the national systems, regulatory bodies? Are they then up to the standard? And I think that this is one of the areas by some independent organizations who are not directly involved in a way to audit this system to make sure that this training is focused and really serves the purpose. And most of this training I have seen is technical in nature. But we need also something on the policy level and, and something which is focused to the governments and regulatory bodies and I see that there might be a gap. I know at the same time it's a bit sensitive because uh, you go to the summer national sovereignty and security type of things. But this is important, and I think we should welcome this uh, international cooperation and those centers of excellence, because then, then you see how your neighboring countries are <coughs> building, and you perhaps start to feel more comfortable with their arrangement, or less comfortable if you, know, you find out some, some deficiencies there. And these are not issues because they are also to do sometimes national security. Terrorism is one, one of those things. So maybe the countries don't want, for example, to disclose too much about their own security arrangements. But on the other hand, it needs to be done. And very often people say that this is part of the transference. That yes, let's be transparent to show our neighbors, we build the confidence, and then we can use nuclear energy in a safe manner because these impacts are regional. But uh, I think that this is another area where people have to give some thought that what is the transparency here? Because maybe there are different kinds of transparency. Transparency in nuclear safety may be easier to handle. 
but the nuclear security transparency is somewhat different. And then you come to the uh, third part of this uh, story, which is this nuclear material verification and uh, nuclear weapons related activities, which, where the transparency perhaps again has a very different meaning. And, uh, this is one of those topics in think tanks like RSIS can do, I think, a valuable contribution. So now I have spent time for the safety and security. And now I should then talk a few minutes about safeguards. Safeguards the role of the IA is quite different from safety and, and security because those two other ones are based on conventions. So the, any, there's no verification to, with the, to measure the undertakings of member states. But safeguards is different because it's based on the non-proliferation treaty, most of it. There are 180 countries plus Thailand and China where IA applies safeguards today based on nuclear non-proliferation treaty, which entered in force in 1972. It's actually one of the most widest adhered arms control related treaties. 172, 80 member states is to a treaty is quite a lot. Actually, it's a more than members of the IAEA. And it's an interesting phenomenon here that the IAEA has the verification role, but the country doesn't need to be a member of <laughs> IAEA. And maybe the most remarkable exception is China, China. Because for obvious reasons, you know, it cannot be any more a member state. It was in 1950s, actually. Taiwan joined the IAEA, but then when China joined, I, Taiwan had to leave. So then, how does this verification of safeguard system work? I try to explain it in a very simple way. First of all, the undertaking there is that all nuclear material and installations in the territory of the country has to be declared to the IAEA by that state party, which means that all nuclear material, all installation, and all activities will be then subject to this IAEA verification system. And this verification, you can compare it more or less like a financial audit. Instead of money and some other assets, you have nuclear materials and nuclear facilities. So the owner has to keep book, books, keep balance, how much nuclear material they have, how much they receive uranium, what is in stock, what they send out. And every now and then the IAEA inspectors come and see the books, check the arithmetics. But then on top of that, they call to the facility and they, instead of counting monies or some other assets, they go and measure whether all the uranium is there, whether it is in the form they set. And then most importantly, are these facilities really used for peaceful purpose? Are they used the way it's been described? Do you see anything which is related, for example, nuclear weapons RFP, which is against the basic principle of non-proliferation treaties? The IAEA has for that purpose an inspectorate, which is basically located in, in Vienna. 250 inspectors are there full time. This Department of Safeguards, which handles this, has about 850 people out of this 2,500 plus of the IAEA. So it's one quarter of the house. In order to do the job, they travel. So we'll go to these nuclear installations all over the world. But there are a few nuances which might be good for you to know. Okay, Singapore is, is the party to the treaty. There are not very many inspections here, but occasionally they drop here because there are some activities which might be of interest and it's an interesting country to stop. But uh, in principle, IAEA doesn't do uh, inspections in nuclear weapons. The five nuclear weapon states which have been recognized by the No Proliferation Treaty, namely China, Russia, United Kingdom, France, and the United States of America. And why? Because they already got the nuclear weapons. So it makes no sense to check the civ civilian industry when the back door is open anyway. 
so they are out of it. But then these other 175 countries are then subject to these routine inspections. Last year, the IAEA did about 8,000 days of inspection effort to those uh, 175 countries. But this is not evenly distributed because like in Japan, since they have plutonium and all these ones, the inspection frequencies much higher there. I think they spent maybe 1,500 out of those 8,000 days. And the other places where they do it is uh, a lot of inspection is still Germany and perhaps Brazil, Canada, because they have quite a wide nuclear industry, and then South Korea in this region. Then we have three countries which have nuclear installations which are not party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, namely Israel, India, and Pakistan. IAEA does some verification work on those three countries based on what uh, a special, uh, what is called item specific safeguards agreement, which originates from the transfer of technology. For example, when the Americans sold to Tarapur a couple of light water reactors in, before Indian nuclear testing in 1974, because then they stopped any selling to, to India. So those reactors have been subject to the IAEA safeguards and verification system, and any uranium and any fuel which goes there and comes as a spent fuel out of those facilities stay or perpetuity under IAEA safeguards. So they cannot divert this material to their repository. So there are such kind of installations in in India, about one dozen. There are a few other reactors, a couple of uh, fuel fabrication plants. And now in the future, a little bit more, because India has voluntarily allocated some additional civilian uh, Indian manufactured nuclear installations for this verification regime in order to have a better access to civilian uh, nuclear technology from foreign countries. And this is going to now grow with the time. And I said that the India nuclear program is going to grow, so is the IAEA activities also going to grow there. But anything that India has to do with the military applications, with the nuclear weapons, or some other military applications, like using our uh, nuclear fuel for submarines, will not be subject to it. A similar division, division exists in Pakistan. So there are a few reactors. One came from Canada and the rest from China, which are under the IAEA verification scheme. But anything which Pakistan has done it with nuclear weapons program, in uranium enrichment, and now more recently in plutonium, are beyond the IAEA reach and without any international control. And Israel. There is a small research reactor from 1960s, I think it is in, in, in Tel Aviv. So that is for the IAEA verification, but none of the other very large nuclear establishment of uh, Israel is under IAEA verification scheme. Now, with this increasing nuclear uh, power use, there will be increasing uh, verification effort for IAEA. And then at the end, maybe three, four specific cases just to get you feel, a feel for, for the challenges which this verification regime has. As I said uh, in the beginning that all the verification is based on the declaration by the state, then you can ask the question, what if the state decides to hide something and doesn't de declare it? So how will the IAEA find it? And these are the special cases which we have had in the last two decades when Iraq, uh, Iran, North Korea, Libya, and Syria, and Egypt had some activities which they failed to the, report to the IAEA. And how they did is that actually they built mainly separate secret installations use nuclear material, not taking them from the existing facilities which IAEA was 
very fine because they knew they could be caught, but got some other material from uranium mining or smuggling or buying from other markets in such a way that IAI didn't get aware and then they established these parallel fuel cycles or parallel activities. And so was Iran doing it, just as an example. I perhaps tell what Iran did, Syria did, and North Korea in a very short, and what happens next. So Iran, at the time of Iran-Iraq war, probably for national security reasons, started to look again for other than nuclear power use parallel to the, its power program somewhere 65, 67. And there were all kinds of sanctions in place at that point of time. So they realized at very early stage that the only way for them to develop those materials and skills is to go to the black market and build a separate cycle uh, without telling to the IAEA. And they were fairly successful because at that point of time also the IAEA verification system had not yet met the challenge of Iran. So much so the verification was based at IAEA, just to make sure that all the declared material was there and less emphasis was spent on verification effort to find out undeclared materials and places. But the Iran, Iraq was then the eye-opener. And this is the time when IAEA also got the whiff that something was wrong with Iran, but really didn't act forcefully until 2002, when this big installation in Natanz was revealed. How IAEA can find out if there's a secret nuclear facility in the other end of the NTU, NTU campus? It's not an easy thing, because many of these nuclear installations, there's no kind of sticking landmark which tells that here I am. Uh, IAEA uses actually for this one what we call all information analysis. Looks what you have your in your declared nuclear fuel cycle. You look all these activities really serving the purpose of the civilian pro program such a way they have gone. <coughs> then you look applications, acquisition of equipment, acquisition of technologies. You get sometimes also information from a third parties and intelligence, and then you put this picture together and see whether this picture which you have is cohesive, whether it makes sense, are there gaps or anomalies which you don't understand in this picture. That's how it works. And like in case of Iran, i just give you one example. Then when we went in 2003, Mars to Natanz and so these centrifuges. They said that you know we have built this 100 centrifuges which we are now putting up and actually we will have soon 1,000. We have never used any nuclear material for that. This is our own invention, and we are good students of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Well, you cannot build a centrifuge just by on the drawing table. And you will not build hundreds or thousands of them before testing them at least once to see that they work. Because they are very complicated things. The centrifuge when you separate uranium, it's based on the centrifugal force. So there's a tiny small difference in the weight of uranium 235 isotope and 238. And in order to separate them, you put them to spin in a cylinder. And the higher one, higher weight goes outside and the light weight stays inside. And then you have a tiny small scoop which picks up those which have been in, uh, enriched. But the difference is very small. It's something like 1.1. So if you have a feed in 1% enriched uranium, you get 1.1 out. So you have to build it to several stages, which are called cascades. That sounds trivial. But in order to put this to spin, 
it has to do something like 60,000 revolutions per minute. Or if you turn it to the velocity. So the ball velocity is in a very simple centrifuge, the same velocity as the velocity of sound. And then more advanced centrifuges, it goes maybe two, three times higher. So now the engineers understand that this is quite a challenge. Uh, tremendous forces uh, involved. You need very special materials, special steels, which are at the same time they have to be steels which you can machine. You can put them somehow together, but they are still very rigid so that they don't break. And that's where the challenge is, and that's why you need all this experimentation. Plus, that there are very few manufacturers to those. They are almost maybe with these two hands together. And that's how then the IAEA found on this Iranian case that the story which they told to the IAEA was not quite true. And then this led to this long process which now came to this joint plan of action with Serotic. If someone wants to ask, I will tell more detail, but not now. Then, finding on North Korea was a very big North Korea had also for decades a nuclear program, and then they joined the NPT in 1986. But they actually didn't conclude this safeguards verification agreement with the IAEA until 1992. And then they made their own declaration with that. This facility was the reactor there in Neon Pion reprocessing plant, fuel fabrication plant, and a couple of small research facilities. And say that this is what we have been running here last 20 years. This is the material we have produced. Please have a look at it, measure it. And you know, that's all what we have. And now the IAEA had, as I said, it got this shock in the early 1990s about this secret Iraqi nuclear program. So IAEA took a very different approach and started to look at this material and ask, is this picture cohesive? Is it really that all pieces which are there that they fit, fit with each other? And uh, here came then the difference. So North Korea said that we had separated 60 grams plutonium. It's not very much. Actually, plutonium is a very heavy met metal. So it's just a little bit powder at the bottom of the white now when you have already 60 grams. Just a spoonful. And then they said that these are the wastes which we have produced while we separated this plutonium. And then we did it in those and those laboratories. So what the IAEA then did is that it went and took samples from those laboratories. Look, the isotopic composition, because plutonium is now a different, it has several isotopes, but uranium has basically two. And we found out that, look, you know, when you look this material over there, it's in the base, it has a very different isotopics from this plutonium powder base. On. And then the question for North Korea was, okay, we see this plutonium powder, but we have not seen the waste. But we have seen the waste, where is the plutonium for that waste? And then that started this conversation. We set it up then with the agreed framework, which was limited, and then as you know, North Koreans continue all the time parallel these activities, and then today they have at least nuclear explosives, if not nuclear weapons. So th these are a the couple of small challenges, and I think that this is perhaps time to for me to stop. And you know, if you want to have, make some questions, and I'm glad to ask any of those or something else. You're welcome.